let's get going. And I think the reason why I wanted to, to focus on this subject in particular, and particularly leopards and, and leopards and trees, is I think it, it does, people do sort of tend to get a little bit nervous when they're faced with that, um, with that scenario, you know, photographing a leopard in a tree can sometimes be um, very stressful because it, it's such a beautiful animal and immediately it gets, um, gets the nerves going. You know? Even if people are just seeing a leopard lying down or moving, people kind of get flustered um, about it. You know? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through um, a few things that um, I think will help you just sort of look for things to, to photograph. Um, in the future, look for particular moments to photograph. Yeah, too much pressure. <laughs> Alyssa, you say you're cursed. I can tell you now, I think uh, on your uh, Mashatu Mala Mala trip next year, I'll put money on it that you, um, you're you going to see one. Uh, Melena, you've got a question. I see you've got, got your hand up. It might just be a, um, an error, but if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to, to give me a shout. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be showing uh, like a few things as I mentioned, which I think will help you um, nail those images when they when you're presented with them. I think it, a big part of it comes down to being able to read animal behavior um, and you know, positioning yourself in the right place before something happens. But you've got to sort of look uh, or sort of know what image you have in mind before you create it, if, if that makes sense. I think that that's half the battle and um, hopefully by me sharing some of these images with you, it might, might give you a few ideas of, um, of images to capture. Oh, Milena, just saying hi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, let's, let's start off with the, with the first image and it's the obvious image of a leopard in a tree. It, it's, it's still beautiful. And a lot of the times people will say, you know what, this image has been created over and over again. And I agree 100%. It has been created so many times. But you know what, you still need to get it on your portfolio. So don't, like a lot of times people wonder, you know, if you're faced with this particular scene, how can you make it look different to what's already been created? And I think you have to understand that there comes a point, especially with leopards, you know, that it is very, very difficult to create a unique image of, of leopard just because they've been photographed so many times, you know, it, it's right up there, if not on, on the top, definitely in the top three of people's lists on, on any photographic safari, you know. So whenever there's a leopard around, it usually does, does attract the, 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 um, the group of photographers. And it is very difficult to create a unique image of a leopard. But it's, it's a nice thing to add to your portfolio. It's something that who cares how many times it's been created? It's nice to have one in your portfolio that you can say, that is my image. Now, um, a few things that I would usually look for, and um, for those of you who've been on Safari with me, I'm a firm believer of always sort of banking the shots first, right? So if this is the first time you've seen a leopard in a tree. You wanna get those, you, you don't wanna get too fancy with things. You wanna get those solid images, bank them, and then, you know, once you've seen it a few times, then you can start getting a little bit more creative um, with what you're trying to create. But I would, um, in a scene like this with, with a leopard in a tree, one of the, the first things for me is to get that eye contact. Eye contact, as you guys know, with, um, with wildlife, that eye contact is, is everything. And sometimes it, it's just like a split second where they'll look at you and then they look away. And you can actually have a look at, you know, images where the animal's looking at you versus, you know, if the eyes are a little bit closed or it's got that sort of almost expression that is not interested. Whereas this, you can see it's locked on you, it's focused. Um, it just gives the, the image a stronger feel. Now, one of the, the difficult things with photographing leopard is they've got a very long tail. So as you can see uh, on the left-hand side of the frame here, so it is quite important to try and either zoom out um, a little bit more, or what I'll do is I'll move my focal point to the top. So my focal point is still on the, on the head of the leopard, while then also, um, you know, getting that, that tail in. So I know this was shot at F4. So nice shallow depth of field. And, and that's a very good point. 
not all the time, but the majority of the time when a leopard is in a tree like this, majority of the time, if it's lying still, I would more often than not try and go for a shallow depth of field. And the reason for that being is that you might often have quite a few distracting elements in the back. So you can see um, above the leopard, top left, you see like a little branch coming down there. So I try and blur that out as much as I possibly can. Um, so by, by using a shallow depth of field. So that's, that's what I would, I would look for in a, um, like when I presented with the scene first and foremost. So eye contact, make sure you get that tail in. Sometimes when they, when their legs hang down, it can be even more tricky because then, you know, the more you zoom out, the more those distracting elements you start including in your frame. But I worry about that later on from a cropping point of view. So I always say like, if you're not sure, rather zoom out, include everything. You can always crop in afterwards and go for sort of different cropping effects, if that makes sense. If you go in too close and you then start chopping off tails and feet and stuff like that, there's nothing you can do about it. All right. Okay, so um, here's, here's another one. Also again, very shallow depth of field. Um, that beautiful sort of resting position, uh, but you can see the eyes are still open. And uh, even though it's not looking at you, the eyes are wide open and it just gives, it gives that image a bit of a stronger feel. Um, often you, you might have like very bright skies um, behind the leopard, um, unless, you, uh, unless you've maybe got interesting clouds of like a storm or something building up. But usually like late morning or early afternoon, when these animals are resting in trees, you've often got a very, very bright sky behind you. And that'll be um, quite a, um, a cool time to just try and do some high key images. Now I know Mike did a webinar, um, I think it was on Monday, uh, Monday or last week sometime where he discussed these high key images. And what you're basically doing is you, you're overexposing your images. So that completely blow out the whites, which in this particular case will be the sky. But because there's still enough blacks in that, in that bark and in the leopard, in your post-processing, you can then just pull them back a little bit. And I'll actually show you um, maybe one or two images after this, um, after this webinar, uh, just to sort of give you an idea and show you what they, what they look like. So that'll be the obvious first images that, that you'll get, you know, finding the, the leopard resting. So like I mentioned, trying to keep the eyes open, trying to get that tail in. And then, you know, once that leopard sort of sits up or stands up, they, there's a moment that usually, you know, as soon as they stand up, there'll be quite a bit of focus in the eyes. So that it might be because they, they heard something, um, either a, another leopard calling or another predator, or maybe they heard a prey species. So generally what they'll do is they'll sit up and they'll, they'll um, sort of look around. And by, by this stage, and I'm going to show you guys now from a positioning point of view, but by this stage, you have to be in the right position already because they can go from sort of that, um, that position there of sitting up and looking around to going down the tree in a split second. You need to be ready for that and you need to be able to anticipate where they're going to go down. And I'm going to be um, hopefully give you guys sort of a few tips to try and, uh, and predict that, that movement. Okay, so that, that's quite a key moment for me is that sort of sitting up in that intensive stare. Okay, then, and this is not always possible. And to be honest with you, probably about maybe, um, probably about eight, maybe even nine times out of 10. If people that I'm with have photographed leopard before, I'll encourage them to ignore this phase because this is often when things go wrong. You know, when people are trying to follow the leopard and it happens so quickly that then all of a sudden you start losing, um, start losing focus and then to get the, the crucial parts of it coming down then becomes very difficult. But if it's, um, if it's your first time, you obviously want to try and get all the possible shots. Again, it very much depends on the sort of tree that the leopard's in and again, your position. We were lucky in, with, with this tree in the Serengeti. It was pretty open. It had quite a bit of foliage on top, but sort of towards the, the middle and then down towards the, the base, it was, it was nice and clear. So this, in this particular um, sighting, this image was possible. But like I said, most of the time, 
I would ignore this this image because you have that um, the, like the next few images in mind. I just want to see there's a question that's come through. Feel free to keep those questions coming, guys. I'll try and answer them um, in between as I'm as and when I'm talking. Um, that's why an awesome guide is so useful because then uh, absolutely, Lisa, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think you know predicting the the movement of these animals is vitally, vitally, vitally important. So I'm going to be showing you guys, um, yeah, why why it's so important. But yeah, so this image, if you can get it, it's great. But if not, you know, it, it's it's not the end of the world because I'll show you um, which images I think are more important. So positioning of the tree, how the tree is, is slanted, will give you a very good idea of which way the animal is going to go down. So as you can see on this particular side, um, and let me know if, you, if, if it doesn't make sense at all, but by the position of this tree, you can see on the left-hand side of the tree, it is so it is, it is too steep. There, there's no way the leopard is going to go down there unless it jumps from the top down, yeah? So they will, 99% of the time, they will go with the slant of the tree. So in this particular case, go down the right hand side of the tree um, and then sort of you know i'll show you a few examples coming up now where you see where, where the angle is just um, a lot easier to go down than a, a steep drop off not saying they can't do it but more often than not they will try and go with um, with the slant now the animal's position and i'll show you um, a few more examples coming up but usually what they'll do from that sort of sitting position, they'll get up, they'll move down, and then they'll, they'll get to a stage, and it's usually where there's um, a fork in the, in the tree where they'll stop, and they'll stop and, and sort of uh, pause there for a few seconds. They might even look at you, which is the shot that you want, and they'll sort of try and sort of plot their route going down, and also sort of keeping an eye out to see if there aren't any other predators around there. So that's that's a great time to, um, to capture these images. You'll notice as well, and um, for the first few images, maybe with, with the lying down, I will shoot in landscape mode, just sort of to try and get, you know, the, the, the body and that branch going out. So it's more of a landscape scene, try and get that branch in, remember to um, keep the tail in as well. Whereas once it comes down the tree, like visually the energy goes, sort of up and down, goes in a vertical um, movement more, if, if that makes sense. I hope, hope um, what, what I'm saying makes sense to you guys. But in this particular case, you know, you, you want to try and show um, a bit of scale of the place, whereas, you know, if you just had to crop that image down at its feet, it doesn't really give your viewer the, the feel of how high up the, this leopard is. And it also, you always want those leading lines, the line from the tree going up to the leopard. You always want those leading lines when it comes to, um, when it comes to photographing wildlife. I'm going to be talking more about this in a, in a webinar uh, next week, Wednesday, about um, creating visual mass in your images and, and how these leading lines are, are vitally important. Okay, again, depending on your tree, so you'll see this tree, it didn't, have, it didn't really have a fork at the top. So what they'll do is they'll, from that sitting position, they'll come running down quickly. And again, look at how the tree is, um, the tree is positioned. So you see it slants sort of from, if I can show you my mouse here, it slants that way, right? So it means the drop off here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse uh, cursor, but from the, the feet on the other side of that tree, it's a very steep drop off. Whereas this side here yeah, is more of a curve going down. So it's almost like an easier bridge for that leopard to come down, down from. So it, it's vital, like these small things is key because even though maybe if we position ourselves on the other side of this tree, yes, you might have had a better shot from that laying down position. But once you've banked a few of those images, try and think ahead. Because, you know, from it getting up to going down to this position, it's like that. It's literally a split second. And if you had to start the vehicle, move it around, position everyone in, in time, you're going to lose your image. 100% guarantee that. So 
in, in this particular scenario, we did get the bank the shots. We spent maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes with it sleeping. And then we said, okay, I mean, inst instead of creating another thousand images of another leopard sleeping, let's position ourselves, try and get this. It is going to come down at some stage. It's only a matter of when that will be. But when it does come down, you'll then, you won't have to move anywhere. You can set your camera up and you can just start firing away. So you see, once again, in, in this particular scene, shooting in, um, in portrait mode, again, visually, your energy sort of moves vertically, if that makes sense, right? So if you have to, you can shoot this in landscape, but you'll find because the animal is moving up and down, it does lend itself more to shooting in portrait, shooting, shooting vertically. Makes sense, I hope. Uh, sorry, we we'll get. Let's go on to the next one here. Again, sort of climbing down the tree. You see again, there, there's no fork um, present, but what it's going to do here, if you see this side of the tree, nice sort of even gradient going down, whereas this side of the tree, very, very steep. There's also, um, and that, that, that's going to come up soon after this now, um, Roderick, I see your question there. I'm going to come back to that now. Usually once they get to these forks down at the bottom here, not always, but more often than not, they'll stop and, and pause there once again to sort of have a quick sort of scan around and, um, and predict sort of where they're going to go down and also just make sure there's no other predators coming around. Uh, so Roderick, you ask, um, it'll be difficult to maintain focus once the leopard starts racing down the tree. Do you use AI Servo in Canon? Okay, so um, first of all, AI Servo. I always use AI Servo personally, um, even for when an animal is lying flat, because when it comes to wildlife, um, I feel that the animal can go from lying down to getting up and running in a matter of seconds. And what AI Servo does then basically is, is I mean, I'm talking the back button focusing once again. You guys would have heard me talking about back button focusing quite a few times, but you can basically just keep your finger on that AF button if you're in AI servo mode and we'll keep on tracking um, your leopard as it comes down. Yes, um, it is uh, quite difficult to um, keep track of it, but I found in, in this particular scenario, once again, rather zoom out a little bit. So you gotta try and make sure you have a, a fast shutter speed first of all. So you want to be around about that 1,600, 2,000 mark from a, sh a shutter speed point of view. And then if you can, obviously this all depends on light and things like that. If you can, a little bit of depth of field, so aperture of about 7.1, just to give yourself a little bit of room for error. You know that if your focal point maybe slips onto the foot or onto the, onto the neck or on the back, you've still got enough depth of field that your face will be in focus. I wouldn't shoot this at like 2.8, for example, because then your margin for error, if your focal point is not bang on the head, um, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be a bit soft. So, and I would also rather zoom out a little bit. Rather zoom out a little bit. You can, remember, you can always crop in, and that's, uh, that's a, a rule for me every single time when, um, when you're faced with, with, with any action scene, not just a leopard coming down, even with, with hunting and things like that. Always rather zoom out, you can always crop in. But if you go in too close with these action scenes, it happens so quickly that, you know, if you chop off tails and legs and things like that, that's done. Um, so, so a few more questions here. Uh, Roderick, so a uh, server with a single focus point. Yes, um, I, would, I would use a single focus point. You can, um, you can with, when you're doing a, a leopard like this, choose um, six focal points, um, however many you'd like. I, I try and keep it at, at one, um, and then I shoot in, in portrait style, and I just sort of keep moving with, with the leopard. Again, you know, with that, having an aperture of about 7.1, which I'll try and get uh, more often than not, I would, in, that, in this particular case, I would rather than push my ISO up to like 4,000 if I have to, because I want that depth of field, um, so it gives me a little bit of room for error and then just keep that focal point on the neck, on the head area and move down with them. Um, it is easy. I mean, it's I'm not saying it's just sort of snap and, and, and off you go, 
but um, definitely your faster cameras in these uh, sort of scenarios do make it a lot easier. Your 1D, um, 1D models, or if you're talking Nikons, your, your D5s, and then even like the, the Sony, the A9s and things like that. Um, fast shutter speeds, they don't buffer as, as quickly, and it just maximizes, uh, maximizes your, your chances of getting a, a sharp image. Um, so Joanne asks, do you shoot an aperture priority? If so, how do you, how do you, how could you be certain your shutter speed is fast enough to capture the leopard jumping out from the tree? Um, so I would, um, Joanne, that's a, that's a fantastic question. What I would normally do and what I would encourage my guests to do is if a leopard, remember you, you have to be ready before this happens. And that's why I say your positioning is so important. Um, but also I would encourage my, my clients to, before this leopard is even um, coming down, while it's still sleeping, to, if you're shooting an aperture priority, get a reading and see what, what your shutter speed is, you know, around this particular area. Going up at the top there, it depends. A lot of the time there's um, a lot of foliage in the way. For me, this is the business end um, of, of the image because you've got that beautiful, um, usually green um, foreground at the bottom here. You've got um, the tail going up and it, usually you've got less distractions down at the bottom here. So I would have a look, get a reading here. Make sure, uh, first of all, that you've got a fast shutter speed. That you've got the, the aperture that you, um, that you want, so usually about 7.1. I wouldn't normally push more than 7.1 um, just because then, you know, because often when they move, it is very low light. So 7.1. And then I would encourage my clients to also then take a few images, check your exposure, make sure you're happy with your exposure. It's not too dark or too bright. I promise you, please, please, please don't, don't not check um, your exposure because the last thing you want is to then go and fire away a couple of hundred images and to have a look and they're all sort of underexposed or overexposed. Okay, so you have to be ready um, for this before it actually happens. And, and I think that's where the, Position of the vehicle, knowing how the tree is slanted, um, understanding leopard behavior, understanding how they move. That way, you maximize your chances of, of, um, of capturing a sharp image like this. Um, so Lisa's saying, um, at 7.1, what focal length approximately are you talking about? Um, yes, yeah, so Lisa, that, that's, that's a good point. This particular scene, I think, was shot with a 400 mm lens. Um, obviously, if, you, if you're going a little bit closer than um, at like 600, then you know you do leave yourself a bit more sort of room for error. I know you enjoy the 600, nothing wrong with that, but I would then sort of just encourage the, the vehicle to either move further away. But I would, if, if this was our, um, let, let's say for example, day one on our safari, our first leopard we're seeing, our first the first time that you've seen a leopard come down a tree, I would encourage you to rather shoot with a wider lens. Shoot with, I know you've got 100 to 400 as well, rather use that. And then, you know, if you get um, to see it again and again, then you can then sort of try and get creative with it. Shoot closer, um, shoot slow shutter speeds, things like that. Okay. So with, with this particular leopard, we're actually very fortunate um, in the Serengeti this year, we, we spent like almost the entire day with this leopard and she went up and down the tree maybe about seven or eight times. This is the beginning and eventually like you can shoot 600, you can shoot slow shutter speed, um, you can do whatever. So, but as a rule from the beginning, rather shoot wide and then sort of work your way closer after that. Okay, now for me, th these are the, these are the sort of shots that you also want to catch. Remember I said at that fork in the tree. So if, um, if you remember a couple of images ago that sort of jumping down, uh, let me just show you the same sighting. Um, so from this here, that's the same tree, same sighting. So comes down, jumping down, and then at that fork, they're going to stop down. And I promise you guys, they, they do this more often than not stop look around they're also sort of seeing what you are you know making sure that you're not going to disturb them you're not going to be in the way and also again just scanning around and 
on their surroundings. And this gives you a fantastic time to, to capture beautiful images. And in this particular case, I think you, you've got a bit of um, freedom to do what you like from a creativity point of view. I think it, it's easier to get the tail in. More often than not, the tail will, will, will curl up. So you can shoot in landscape mode, or you can even shoot in portrait and try and get the base of the tree going up. Again, fantastic eye contact, ears going forward. So th this will be, for me, a moment to, to wait for, you know, like that sort of standing up, all the distractions and sort of stressing about trying to get um, shots in there and, and then messing it all up. Also then, you know, there's a good chance that your camera's gonna buffer. Then when you get to a scene like this, you, you might be low on memory or you might have wasted a few images where I think these are the, these are the crackers and, and it's also it's standing still. So it's, it makes it a bit easier as well. Again, another one, she's not snarling at us, but she, um, this, this was at uh, the end of a, of a yawn, but um, also again, same leopard, same day. But again, getting into that fork of the tree, stop that eye contact looking at you. And once again, you know, you can see how the, how the tree is, is, is slanted. So there's a very slim chance that she's going to go down here just because, you know, that's in the way it's quite steep. The best chance is that she's going to come down, come down this side. So you can position your vehicle once again, depending on what you want. And majority of the time, I, I love to get that side on profile. I think that is, that is really pretty. But, you know, it, it all depends on what your background is like. We had quite a messy background and at the sort of uh, towards the, the right here. So we decided that if, if she comes down, she's going to come down straight towards us. Uh, and we were quite happy with that. Okay. All right, so, so these are the moments. And again, like I can't emphasize it enough. Look for that fork in the tree. Um, I can't tell you, it's, it's almost like clockwork. They, they do that all the time. Alyssa, I'm expecting you when you uh, come back from the Mala Mala Mashata trip, I expect to see at least one of these um, in your portfolio. Again, um, same tree. Stop, pause, and, and usually they'll, they'll do this for a few seconds. Um, so it gives you plenty of time to, um, you know, to prepare yourself. Again, from, from this point of view, it's, um, I like looking for those, those small, small details. So ears forward, eyes open, um, and you just got that beautiful, those beautiful patterns. And you'll find often what, what I also like about this with them getting lower is you're almost on, on eye level then. And a lot of the times, I mean, in this particular case, that she came down a little bit too early, <laughs> said no one ever. Um, but you, you, you do still have a bit of that bright sky in the back, right? So that is possibly um, a little bit distracting, whereas ideally you want that sort of nice dark background or um, you know, either from the vegetation or from the dark skies. Again, sort of looking around, it's also um, a nice pose that's sort of looking to the left, looking to the right, um, and just, I mean, absolutely fantastic animals, beautiful, beautiful animals to, to capture. There's a good chance as well that they that they might give you a bit of a stretch, and um, you know, be especially when once they sort of start start moving, you know, whether they're up in the tree or you know on their way down, they, there's a good chance they'll give you a stretch, maybe combined with uh, a few yawns before they go down the tree, and um, they uh, they enjoy doing that. Again, you know, looking how the tree is positioned, um, we knew that. And again, it's the same leopard. We knew that she was going to come down here. She was going to follow follow this route all the way down. You know, there's she could have. I mean, if, if she was, if she really, really wanted to, she could have jumped from the top there. But that's only maybe um, if she got sort of flustered by something or um, or upset by something. This was going to be her path coming down, and then we predicted that she was going to come down here just because of these stumps and things that were blocking away down that side you can see this is a very easy way for her to come down again we wanted to position maybe on on the left hand side here but then a lot of these branches and these branches were in the way and 
sort of made for quite a messy ba um, background. So again, we decided this while she was still sleeping. And even, the, even if it means that you have to spend half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, even two hours sitting, waiting and not photographing anything, the rewards are so much higher when you then get it coming towards you. You know you're ready. You've checked your exposure. You've checked your shutter speed. Everything has been checked. And when it comes, all you have to do is focus and fire away. You're not rushing around trying to sort of go around corners and then some people can't see, some people can see, and your settings are all wrong. So a lot of this comes down to planning, preparation, and again, understanding animal behavior. Again, have a look at the, at the tree again. You can see, I think I showed this tree a little bit earlier as well. So let me just see, I think it is. Uh, I've just got it. That was one, one of the ones, this one, yeah. Same tree. And you can see, stop waiting and it, it comes down here, just because of the, the way that tree is, is positioned. Uh, so Roderick asked, um, as you're often shooting up a tree, you will usually have the sky as the image background. If you want to maintain a bit of color in the sky, you'll need to underexpose quite a bit. Do you just lift the shadows or in post or rather accept a bright colorless sky? What are your thoughts on using flash for this purpose? Um, Roderick's 100%, you know, if you have those, those bright skies, the, those bright skies that you often get like during winter and, and um, in Southern Africa, they don't have clouds, they don't have detail or anything like that. So there's nothing really there to, um, to expose for. What I would do in that particular case is I would overexpose so completely blow out that sky to be able to get detail in your, in your leopard. If, for example, if I had like a beautiful moody skies and dark clouds or a beautiful sunset, then you can maybe underexpose a bit and hopefully then the, the, the leopard stands up and you get a bit of a silhouette in your leopard. Personally, um, you know, I think I mentioned it in my, um, in my webinar yesterday, is I, I'm not a huge fan when it comes to, to using flashes. And to, to be honest with you, I think during the day, I think it, it's not too bad, but I think at night, just that difference between, um, between it being very dark and then all of a sudden that bright flash popping in your, in your eyes, I'm not convinced it is really good. You can use a, a spotlight. Uh, to me, I think it's just sort of more even light over a period of time. Um, but generally, and I'll, I'll try and show you now, um, sort of one of the images where the, the sky is really bright and just show you the, the raw image and, and the thought process behind it. Okay. I just wanna try and see. And then the last bit, you know, once they, uh, once they sort of had their look, you know that's where they're gonna go down and, and then you can start playing with some really cool shutter speeds. You can, you can go really slow. This was right down to a sixth of a second. Um, and like I said, the only reason we could do this is because she went up and down the tree on, on numerous occasions. But um, so, so those are the, are the three steps that, um, that I think is, is vitally important. I think it was three or four steps, but the initial sort of lying down in the tree, making sure you don't, like your eyes are, are nice and sharp and in focus, you don't chop off that tail. Then the, the coming down part in portrait mode and nice fast shutter speed getting them down. And then to position yourself that you wait for that fork and predict where that animal is going to go down. Then getting it in that, that fork of the tree, waiting for it to, um, to pause there for a few seconds that's going to be your, um, your cracking shot, beautiful time for portraits. And then that last sort of jump um, as it comes down. I think those, th those are the, for me, I think the ultimate moments uh, or the unique moments to look for from a, from a photographic point of view. Um, so Sally asked, when you're panning like that, would you go into manual settings? And um, Sally, no, I actually still keep it in, in aperture priority. Um, and then just keeping an eye on the shutter speed. So uh, one of the first things I'll do is I'll bring my ISO right down to 100. So if I was shooting, uh, I can have a look here. I think I was shooting at 2000 ISO for 
uh, for this to get my, my fast shutter speed, bring my ISO down to 100, have a look at what my, what my shutter speed is. If it's like, for example, let's say 25, I'll just bring my aperture up to like maybe F9, F10, until I get that shutter speed that I want, like a sixth of a second as, as in this case. So usually I find sort of anything, anything from about a 25th of a second up to about a sixth of a second for leopard coming down works really, really well. Yeah, now I wanted to show you guys that, um, so let me see if I can, I hope you guys can, um, um, let me open this here. You guys can see my, um, see this leopard image, I hope. So this is what I mean when, um, when I said that I'll expose for the sky um, when you've got that, that bright sort of sky present, right? So um, I, I'm sorry, I'll expose for the leopard. So I'll overexpose the sky. And what I would then do from a editing point of view, so I can just get this in here. So what I would do from editing point of view, so it's obviously, I mean, it's totally overexposed here, but just have a look. As soon as I bring my blacks down, have a look at what happens. Right? And usually what I would do, um, because you, I mean, when, when you're overexposed like this, you do lose a bit of your color. So, I mean, you can sort of bring some of that color back. And uh, also with the dehaze, um, it also brings a lot of that, that detail back in. Or you can then go into a, a black and white image. And that's more often than not, that's what I would do. So I'll even lift these, these whites a bit more. Um, you can maybe drop the exposure a little bit. Lift some of these whites and then just bring these, these um, blacks down. And even in your tone curve, you can also bring the, the darks down as well. So that's, and you can see how that information starts sort of coming back. Okay, so I, I mean, I literally just did um, a couple of things now. And you can see how it's, it's something a bit different. And I, I won't do this with every single image. But definitely, if you've got those sort of bright skies uh, behind you, this is definitely um, something that you can you can play around with. Is those um, those high key type images? All right. I hope um, I hope that helps a bit. Um, I'll open up now. If you have any any more questions, um, feel free to sort of give me a shot on this. I just want to see if I've answered everyone's questions already. While I'm reading through, you guys feel free to, to send some more. I'm happy to happy to answer them for you. <laughs> Alyssa, you feel prepared. Glad to hear that, man. That's uh, that's fantastic. I look forward to seeing amazing images. There really is, uh, I think, very few places that can beat um, Marla Marla. And it, combining that with Mashatu, I think you guys are in for a for a very good time. Amazing sightings. Tracy, thank you so much. Uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining. Iago, thank you so much. I hope your um, internet issues are all sorted out now. Sorry you didn't miss the, uh, sorry you didn't see the whole thing, but uh, it, as I mentioned, it will be on YouTube uh, in a few days as well. So if there's anything that you maybe possibly missed, it will be on there for you to look at again. Milena, you have to post all the info. Uh, ask any time. Yeah, Milena, feel free anytime, guys. Um, if you have any questions around this, I'm always happy to help. So feel free to to send any, any questions you might have, send any images if you're not sure what to do from a sort of editing point of view. Um, yeah, feel free to, to give us a shot. Um, Iago asked the 300 millimeter 2.8 would be good and fast lens with a teleconverter. Absolutely. I love the 300 2.8. Um, I've shot with it with a 1.4 and a two times converter. Excuse me, and happy days. No problem at all. I mean, I think it all depends 
where you go to. And I think if you go to um, Southern Africa reserves, like the Sabi Sands, where you can go off-road, 300 millimeters is, is plenty. Even a 70 to 200 um, is enough because you can go off-road and you can get pretty close to the wildlife. Whereas I think if you go in East Africa, someplace like uh, the Masai Mara uh, in Kenya or in the Serengeti, maybe need something a little bit more, um, you know, that sort of 400 to 600 mil range works really, really well. Kayla, thank you so much for your support. Michelle, Path, thank you so much. You guys rock. You guys are absolutely amazing. Um, it really means a lot for us, uh, all, your, all your kind feedback. And I hope um, this has helped you guys. Just, um, just to give you a few ideas that when we, um, we get rocking out in the field again, we can, uh, we can all sort of take some of these pointers and create some incredible images. I think that's it um, from me. Um, I hope to catch you guys. I think I'm doing a webinar again. I think next week, Wednesday, I'm doing one on... Um, what am I doing it on again? Mm. Oh, creating visual mass. That's right. So it's um, it is a premium webinar. So it's a paid webinar um, for twenty dollars, um, and we're going to be discussing creating visual mass uh, visual mass in quite a bit of depth. And I know Jerry is also up at, at seven South African time. So it's in about in about two hours time. Jerry will be discussing um, cropping in Lightroom. So that'll be a cool one to go and watch. Um, but then till next week, I hope you guys have a fantastic week, fantastic day, wherever you might be. Thank you so much for joining and uh, we'll catch you again soon. Cheers.